My talk today is on electrons, protons, and energy produced from the zero-point field. And this is a discussion of one of my pet peeve topics that protons and electrons are produced somehow, and why aren't we looking into it? You would think it would be something that experimentalists would be looking into, how to make protons and electrons without any matter. Uh, because it seems to be a slam dunk Nobel Prize winning thing if you can figure out how to do it and prove it. And then the side point being that you should be able to get energy out of it as well. And so that's what my talk is about today and trying to encourage other people to do research on this topic. Now the first key point is electrons and protons exist. So it means they've either been here forever, or they're produced somehow. And most physicists tend to lean toward them being produced somehow. So why aren't we working on that? And since electrons and protons can be produced, then you're going to get energy out of it. At a very, very minimum, you're going to get hydrogen production. And if you have an electric current set up, you'll get electric current because you get you have electrons. And it's probably going to be a hot process, fairly high energy, so you'll be able to extract heat. So there's going to be several different ways to extract energy from it once we're able to produce protons and electrons in a re repeatable way. So the question historically has been, was the production of electrons and protons a one-time thing, or does it happen all the time? Is it continuous? And this is actually really important in cosmology, because under the current cosmological argument, they state that, oh, it only happened one time, it can only happen one time, and we're not going to see it ever again. Well, I disagree with that. I think that it's a continuous process. And part of the reason I feel that is that the physical constants arise from the quantum field. And that's my theoretical area of expertise, quantum field theory. And they form a unique set. So the natural laws of physics arise from the quantum field theory. And they're uniform. So whatever process allows there to be proton-electron production will allow there to be proton-electron production today, tomorrow, any time in the past. So I say if you're a scientist and you make your first assumption being that the laws of nature are constant or change slowly at most, then we should be able to make protons and electrons rather than be stuck with a one-time event. And I put the flying spaghetti monster in there as a little joke. So what we have, if we can produce protons and electrons in a relatively reasonable way, is a potential source of infinite amounts of energy. And then if we turn it around and the process is reversible, we could have, really have, infinite energy if we can annihilate protons and electrons with each other and get energy out. It will be equivalent to matter any matter energy production in the total amount of energy without having to produce the any matter. The, the question most people may ask is, well, we can't make protons and electrons because conservation of energy is violated. And I'm of a mind that says conservation of energy is not violated and protons and electrons exist, so here we are. I, I don't think this is a valid reason to not pursue trying to produce protons and electrons. And uh, in addition to that, I'll say that there's lots of energy in the zero-point field, in the quantum field. And if we can tap into that, 
then we have a source of all the energy we need. And then you might be saying, well, that's talking about free energy from the zero point field. That's crazy talk. Well, I don't think so. And as I said, I've studied quantum field theory for a long, long time. And what I've learned is that all energy ultimately comes from the zero point field, whether it's fission or fusion or solar or batteries, or combustion, or even hydroelectric gravitational potential, it all comes ultimately from zero-point energy, from quantum field energy. So if we have all these mechanisms we already know about that we can use to extract energy from a quantum field, why not find another one? And I think proton-electron production whatever the mechanisms may be, offers us that opportunity to extract energy. So looking at how that might occur, where we can get this free energy from the zero point field, the first thing we look at is what is mass to begin with? And you're probably aware of E equals mc squared, the derived by Poincaré and then Einstein. Being a quantum field theorist, I say that permittivity and permeability of the quantum field are emergent properties of the field and the most fundamental constants. And so rather than putting it in terms of the speed of light, I like to think of it as mass equals energy times the permittivity and permeability constant. And then if you say that E equals HF, and you said to put in natural units where Planck's constant H is equal to 1, then mass is frequency times permittivity and permeability. Which gives us an entirely electromagnetic view of what mass is based on quantum field energy. Now, as introduction to some concepts that follow, there's something called the Casimir effect. And in the popular two-plate example shown here, you have plates that get pushed together by the quantum field itself. And they're pushed together by Van der Waals forces. That there are Van der Waals forces pushing on bodies all the time, on all sides. But if two bodies are very close together, there isn't as much pressure pushing them apart as there is pushing them together. And these Van der Waals forces are forces between dipoles, they're dipole interactions, which means that the quantum field is filled with dipoles. And that fits the standard particle pair model of quantum field theory, which says that you have pairs of particles. Now, Paul Dirac, as part of the Dirac equation, had two solutions to the equation. And one part of the term was mc squared, and the other one was negative mc squared. So he had this question of what's this negative energy? And of course, we realize now, uh, and he's been given credit for discovering any matter, that this negative energy particle was any matter. So Dirac was faced with the question is, what is this mass? Where does mass come from? And he came up with the idea back in 1930 that maybe the positron and electron get their mass because they have to push against the quantum field, uh, his version of it, which we call the Dirac C. And so that was an early attempt to figure out the cause of mass that most people don't pay much attention to, but I thought it was interesting and decided to follow up on it. And and the way you can think about it is in terms of protons, that protons scatter light and particles, which means they also scatter quantum fluctuations, which means they displace quantum fluctuations. 
and protons have a charge radius. So when they're scattering, protons behave like they have a spherical shell. And the spherical shell is believed to be made of quantum fluctuations. In the standard model, those quantum fluctuations are said to be uh, quark pairs, or perhaps gluons. And in my research, I say they're proton-antiproton pairs. But whichever is correct, you still have this spherical structure of quantum fluctuations that is scattering other quantum fluctuations, which means they're displacing the energy of the zero-point field. So we can treat it like a Casimir cavity and measure that energy. And what you find when you make some approximation as to what the shell thickness is, the amount of energy excluded from the quantum field by a proton is equal to the proton's mass. And there's no way this is a coincidence uh, that the mass of the proton just happens to equal the amount of quantum field energy excludes. And part of it that's interesting is that the thickness ends up being the thickness of the wavelength of a proton any proton fluctuation with the energy of a proton. So the thickness of the shell around a proton is equivalent to the quantum uncertainty of the measurement of the energy of the proton, which is essentially what we should expect. Now when it comes to electron mass, you can solve the problem the same way. But with an electron, the diameter of the electron is equal to the Compton wavelength, which is also not a big surprise since the Compton wavelength has always been associated with mass in some way. So it makes an electron appear like it has some type of quantum fluctuation cell structure at the Compton wavelength. And that means that electron and proton mass are a purely electromagnetic effect, and that their mass comes from the amount of zero-point energy that they displace. Now you may say, well, where does this Compton wavelength come from? Electron don't really have a structure there. But if you look at electron magnetic moment, it really looks like they do. Uh, in a standard equation for magnetic moment, physicists have put the mass of the electron in there, but you don't get magnetic moment from mass. And if you substitute the Compton wavelength in instead, you end up with the term here, where the magnetic moment is due to the charge of the electron, the speed of light, and a radius equal to half the Compton wavelength, which makes perfect sense, plus a factor of 2 for the g factor and a geometrical factor of 4 pi. So it makes perfect sense that there must be some type of physical structure there because both mass and the uh, magnetic moment require it. So then we also have an answer to the question of why is there a g factor? Why is a g factor 2? And that's because there's dipoles in this uh, shell structure. So when a positive charge is moving one way, negative charge is moving the other. So if you wanted to do a rotating spherical shell model approximation of an electron, instead of having a single shell rotating in one direction, you have two shells rotating in the opposite direction. And they contribute approximately equal but opposite amounts of magnetic moment to the total magnetic moment of the electron. And so that's why the factor of g is closer to 2. Uh, but they're not exactly equal, so it's not exactly equal to 2, because dipoles have some thickness, some wavelength themselves. And we have the question about 
do protons really scatter quantum fluctuations? And if we look, consider the strong nuclear force, we can find that the Casimir force between two protons has the range of the nuclear force and, and the energy. It's about 100 times stronger than the Coulomb force at half a femtometer. And it becomes stronger than the Coulomb force at about three femtometers. And while people generally say, well, the Casimir force is very weak, and that's true at long distance, but the Casimir force normally varies to the distance to the fourth power, on a Coulomb force is distance squared. So as the distances get very close, at some point the Casimir force is going to become stronger. And it turns out that occurs at roughly three femtometers, which is strong enough that the Casimir force can account for the strong nuclear force within the nucleus. So that supports the idea that protons are displacing quantum fluctuations. So the answer to your question, how is energy conserved? It comes from the zero point field. Electrons and protons can be produced without any outside source of energy. And not only that, we can consider that they don't actually change the amount of energy in free space. To, and when a proton and electron combine to make a neutron, it still doesn't change the amount of energy in free space. So next we can consider quantum fluctuations. What are quantum fluctuations made of? Well, as I discussed earlier, they appear to be dipoles, particle pair dipoles. And so naturally one of those particle pairs is electron-positron pairs. And so whatever form they take in their quantum form, there's something like an electron already in the quantum field. And if we also consider quantum fluctuations of a proton, any proton type, then that means there's protons already in the quantum field. So we should be able to extract these electrons, positrons, protons, and antiprotons from the quantum field, which we can do using pair production. Um, but the real trick, it appears, is how do we get rid of the antimatter? And that's, that's really the, the question. Um, and theoretically, I don't have an answer for how that happens. But because electrons and protons exist without the antimatter, we know that it happens. And so I think the way to attack the problem is to come up with experiments where we can confirm proton-electron production and then figure out the antimatter question later based on the data. Uh, because after all, it needs to be consistent with experimental data anyway. And then we have the proton quark model problem. If you have quarks, a proton made of quarks and an electron that's not made of quarks, how do you get an equal number? The universe, as far as we can tell, is electrically neutral. And so you have to have an equal number of electrons and protons. Of the 10 to the 80 of protons and electrons in the visible universe, that number needs to be equal to by 40 orders of magnitude, or else we would have a net positive or negative charge and all the stars would re repel from each other electrically and instead of having gravity being the dominant force. And so we have a question of how do you get protons and electrons in the same amount? And it's really difficult. The only way with the quark model is if they're produced together in the same interaction. And if you talk about the Big Bang theory, they say currently that you have a quark gluon plasma and the particles come from that. Well, where do the electrons come from? And, and again, why is there an equal number of protons and electrons if you're starting with quark gluon plasma? And even if you do have a case where protons and electrons are produced together, you 
you're probably dealing with a situation where they have to have a similar type of structure so that they are so that they emerge in the same way in order to make sure that you have an identical number of both types of particles. And there's also the possibility that as part of this theoretical mechanism of proton-electron production, that they're produced as neutrons, because that way you ensure there's an equal number. And then the neutrons could decay to give us free protons and electrons. And so that's something to consider when you're thinking about theoretical models. <clears throat> then we have the idea of primary versus secondary production as I like to call it. In primary production, you can take a region of empty space with nothing but quantum field and have protons and electrons pop out of it. And that would be the most fundamental way that we get proton and electron production. But in secondary production, we could, would always already have particles present and we can change the voltage, pressure, current, and other types of parameters and potentially increase the production rate, come up with a slightly different mechanism to make it more efficient. And in terms of energy production, that's what we want. We want a form of secondary production because primary production, whatever the mechanism may be, must be very slow or the universe would be saturated with protons and electrons. To get some idea about how proton electric electron production might happen, we can consider the filamentary structures in space. That when we map galaxies, as this picture shows, we have a, uh, a picture of our universe that makes it look like the galaxies form along these strings or filaments. And these filaments are of plasma. And when we look at stars within galaxies, we also see similar filamentary structures where it appears like stars appear along the filaments. So there appears to be a tie-in with production of galaxies and stars and, and plasma filaments. So that brings us to the Z-pinch. At various places along these plasma filaments, there's occasionally a Z-pinch, and that's frequently where we find stars, or sometimes maybe a slightly more luminous region of plasma. And in this picture of the Ant Nebula, which may or may not be that type of Z-pinch zone, um, because there are two schools of thought on these types of nebula, and one is that it's a dead star that blew off uh, part of it and formed this nebula around it. And the other idea is it's part of a filament where you have a Z-pinch where a star is growing. And in the star growing theory, people will say, well, electrons and protons are being collected from the filament through currents. Um, but what I'm proposing is that we have conditions here in a Z-pinch along a plasma filament for proton-electron production and that stars can be grown and galaxies can be grown uh, due to the electrical conditions. And to follow up on that, we can consider main sequence stars like our sun as main sequence stars age, they tend to grow in size and get bigger. And currently astrophysicists model that with the idea that they're losing mass uh, due to the solar wind the entire time, and, but somehow still growing while they lose mass. But what if they were growing because they gained mass? Uh, if, if that were true, then it makes it much more understandable to understand why they're growing. Uh, and looking in particular at our Earth, it's thought that the Earth will grow so large that it'll engulf, or the Sun will grow so large that it'll engulf Earth at some point. 
And that's an increase in volume of a million times. And as I say, it's much more believable if there's a process whereby the mass is increasing within the sun during that time. I'm not saying that mass has to be the only part of the process. The astrophysicists have worked out processes that they feel work fine without the growth. But if you added an increase in mass, it would simplify things. And we even see this with arguments about the geology of Earth. And before you laugh and say, oh, this expanding Earth is crazy talk. I, I felt the same thing 10 years ago. And then at a conference, I sat through a talk by James Maxlow. And I thought, you know, this guy sounds like he's got, he's level-headed and he's done some good research. So I got a copy of his PhD dissertation that he had published and read it through and it is very convincing. Just one caveat. In order for expanding Earth model to be true, matter has to be produced within the Earth. So at some point we have to find electron and proton production within the Earth for this theory to be real. But I suspect that it is, and I suspect that once we understand all the mechanisms for proton and electron production, we'll realize that the expanding Earth model is correct. So, the real meat of it is that we've already seen proton electron production before, or at least some early experimenters have, and it's been ignored. The earliest I've seen reference is from Clarence Skinner, a professor at University of Nebraska, who published a series of papers between 1905 and 1913, where he talked about how hydrogen was evolving from the anodes in his cathode ray tube apparatus that he was experimenting with. People were worried that it wasn't real, they worried it wasn't reproducible, uh, people claimed that it was just bad laboratory technique and that the hydrogen was leaking in from someplace else that he just didn't account for properly. But even if you don't trust Clarence Skinner, who most people have never heard of, maybe you trust J.J. Thompson. And he said, Though you may heat the glass tube to the melting point, may dry the gases by liquid air or cool charcoal, and free gases you let into the tube as carefully as you will from hydrogen, you will get hydrogen lines by the positive ray method. Even when the bulb has been running several hours a day for nearly a year. So J.J. Thompson found hydrogen production in his cathode ray tube experiments in, that he talked about in 1913 and 1914. And so I, I trust him. I trust him that if he saw hydrogen production, I believe it. And the positive ray method he mentions, of course, is mass spectrometry. He invented the mass spectrometer at this time frame, and that's how he looked at what he was being, what was being produced within his cathode ray tubes. In addition to that, he saw early forms of low energy fusion. That when he ran his tube with hydrogen in it, he would eventually get deuterium, and he got a molecule he called X3, which we know now to be tritium, and he got helium, which means he was probably also producing neutrons. So you've seen a form of low energy fusion in his cathode ray tubes. And then when he added oxygen to the mix, he produced neon. And in fact, a num numerous experimenters were reporting anomalous neon uh, in their cathode ray tubes, gas filled tubes. Um, during that time frame. And then, not too long after, people started 
using vacuum, totally evacuated x-ray tubes. Some people start, stopped experimenting with these gas-filled cathode ray tubes. And after that, we stopped hearing about it. And we've also had numerous reports of anomalous x-ray production. There's, there's so many people have have reported anomalous energy at different points, and it's hard to catalog them all. Um, of course, this is normally considered to be experimental error, uh, but it's worth investigating because what if it's electron and proton production? Now, one project that's been recently in the news is the Sapphire project. Now I say I personally don't agree with the electric sun model that they're testing. But as a plasma researcher myself, I am interested in some of the results they see with plasma. Particularly because they have reported having excess energy production. And they've also reported transmutation of elements. The elements are appearing in their experimental apparatus. And that's definitely worth following up on. And so that leaves the question, could they be producing hydrogen as well and making protons and electrons? And while I don't think this experimental apparatus is ideal for energy production, it certainly provides some baseline research that, that you might find interesting. Um, and if you've studied energy sources of the Korea PAGD post abnormal glow discharge experiment is fairly well known. Uh, I cite it as one of the better documented experiments of this type. Unfortunately, it's never been developed, and so we don't know how, I mean, if it's really real, because it's never been developed into a real source of energy. But it gives us an idea of how we might proceed. And then I had some experiments I did on my own. I was trying to develop a high energy x-ray source and I found, and I wanted to run vacuum arc discharge using an AC circuit to try to multiply the uh, production of x-rays. And I found I could get fairly high x-ray production that way within the gas and at both electrodes. But what we found is that we could get a thousand Rankins at three meters of x-rays um, from a hundred watt tube. But if you, if you actually measure that considering a 360 degree volume, that's a kilowatt of x-rays, uh, which should be impossible. Now to be fair, we would see catastrophic failures of the current limiting circuit of the, and resistors that would be destroyed. So the likely answer is that the resistor circuit gets destroyed and in the process we briefly have a high amount of, uh, of x-ray production before the breaker trips. And so that's why I never published this as an anomalous source of energy. But it has got my curiosity up as to is there something more going on. And also in talking about fusion, I did put deuterium in there in place of the uh, uh, xenon photogas we normally use and was able to get high amounts of fusion. Um, so high that it pegged our PNR 4 meter and we immediately had to shut it off because I didn't have uh, proper neutron uh, shielding for us. And I've never been able to follow up on this. But I do think that there's low energy fusion going on in this type of apparatus and we should be doing more investigation on low energy fusion in the simple vacuum arc discharge apparatus uh, before getting into much more complicated designs. So, it appears like 
the most likely place where we see electron and proton production is in plasma. So we can consider plasma filaments, plasma pinch, uh, pulse vacuum arc discharge, AC vacuum arc discharge, pulse abnormal glow discharge. Uh, I've heard of anomalous energy coming in exploding wire experiments. Uh, someone who has laser or magnetically confined plasma experiment could try to do a proton electron production experiment or inertially confined. So there are a lot of experimental apparatuses that already exist that could be potentially adapted to trying to see if we can first produce protons and electrons and secondly to see if we can extract energy from it. Now I'll go back to primary production because I would propose that someone make a large vacuum chamber with sensors in it and see if protons and electrons or hydrogen pop out of the quantum field all by their own. And I put a picture of a neutrino detector just to give sort of the scope of scale and size and general idea of what it might look like. But that's a bigger project that would have to be well funded. But secondary production experiments can be done quite cheaply. They can be designed for high efficiency, low cost. Um, you can design it to try to have an easy way of extracting uh, electric current by use of coils. Um, you can have a way to extract heat and also a way of um, collecting the hydrogen. Now I personally prefer vacuum arc discharge and normal glow discharge regime type experiments because it's a very simple low cost apparatus, runs at reasonable low energy so you don't need highly specialized equipment. And you can have coils for energy extraction, heat for extraction through oil cooling systems and vacuum for extracting the hydrogen. Um, you have to make sure you have a hydrogen-free environment, and you need to make sure that you do laboratory tests to prove that, including the fill gas. You need to have hydrogen detection systems in place to prove proton-electron production, um, and probably several to be convincing. So optical spectrometry, mass spectrometry, residual gas analysis, and outside laboratory residual gas analysis and outside laboratory analysis of the hardware after the fact showing that there's no residual hydrogen in the hardware other than perhaps it's now in your electrodes. And that would be something good to know too. Um, electrical design, you're dealing with high voltage so safety comes first. You also have to worry about stray grounds, losing energy through grounds so you want to to use non-conductive components as much as possible, wireless controls and monitoring. Um, be careful about stray capacitance, inductance resistance as that affects operation of a high voltage system. So it's a very complex system to develop and to do it right. And then of course the energy measurements, when you get down to can you prove that you're producing energy that you can use um, is going to be a challenge, although hopefully there's enough that it's not too big of a challenge. So we, you need to do monitoring at the front end, at the back end, maybe operate in a closed loop, maybe run a second apparatus that has a known amount of energy it uses. Um, but very careful thought needs to go into that so that you have something that ends up being convincing. And in the end, the most convincing thing is to actually have power generation where you can put power out where it can be used. So, good luck. Uh, I hope that my talk has encouraged some of you to think about performing these types of experiments. And I hope to as well in the future when, when I get past some current projects I'm done with.
I went ahead and included some references for those who want to look those up later. And there's my email, so if you want to discuss any of this or have any questions for me, I'm happy to talk with you about it. So thank you very much for watching my presentation.